right. Oh, very good. Oh, yeah. Hey, calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London calling Rick Byer in Chicago. It's amazing. We're actually both in our home. Where we're towns. supposed to be, yeah. Yeah, right. uh, it's like the first show in a while. It seems like we're we're on the road a lot. But welcome everybody to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help and assistance of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. And Chris and I will be traveling the globe soon, but we're still going to manage yeah. to make it here most Sundays to have a cocktail and talk about history. And today we'll be talking about the World War II parallels of the tragic conflict in Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. And Chris, who who do we have? Uh, do we have anybody joining us today? Well, uh, so far, oh uh, yeah, there are lots of folks. We have uh, John from uh, Toronto, uh, and uh, Nancy's back. Frank Cook from Attleboro, Massachusetts, and Wally, Doreen, uh, Ted Moon, uh, and Lynn Hargrove. Oh, was, so some good, some good representation yes. today and more joining uh, uh, yes. as every moment goes by. Yeah. So I think because we have uh, uh, three guests today, Chris, we should get right into it. So give me the okay. cue and I'll start us off. <laughs> Is open. The bar is open. Uh, Chris, the ongoing war in Ukraine is, uh, as you know, the bloodiest conflict in Europe since World War II, and it brings to mind many striking parallels with the events of 1939 to 1945. Is, is history repeating itself in some way? What insights can we draw from that era that help us understand this conflict? And as someone who lives with World War II history week in and week out, it seems to me the parallels are many and chilling. Yeah. So um, today we're going to make a rare foray into current events to talk about those questions with three smart historians who have all been on this show before, and I can't wait to hear what they think. So we're going to talk to Sean McMeekin, who is a professor at Bard College and talked to us last April about his book, Stalin's War, A New History of World War II. Uh, David Murphy is a lecturer in military history and strategic studies at Maynooth University in Ireland, and he was on last July to talk about the Finnish Soviet War, 1939-1940. And Keith Lowe has written numerous acclaimed books on World War II and was on with us to talk about, uh, in January, to talk about prisoners of history, uh, what monuments to the Second World War have to tell us about our history and ourselves. So we want to welcome all, th ooh, we want to welcome everybody. We almost left David out there, but we want to welcome all you guys to History Happy Hour. Thank you so much. Uh, for joining yeah. our, our multi-continental dr history drinking session. <laughs> <laughs> nice to be back. Yes. Excellent. Good to be here. And Thanks cheers to you, cheers to you yes, all. Cheers. Uh, cheers. I'm, I'm going to start off with an open-ended question, it really just to say, what parallels with World War II do you see that strike you as most apt, most chilling, most striking, uh, most revealing? Take your choice. Uh, and uh, we, we agreed to do this, uh, to avoid any decision making, we agreed to do this in alphabetical order. So we're starting with Keith Lowe. Keith, uh, give <laughs> us a shot here. <laughs> okay, yeah, so alphabetical by surname. There we go. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, it, there are lots of, par there are certainly lots of echoes. Um, I mean, you kind of uh, pick an event in the, in the Second World War and you can find some, some things which uh, you know do do um, resonate. So the first thing that springs to mind is, of course, the Munich um, crisis, Munich Agreement, perhaps all the appeasement which went on before uh, the Second World War. Um, you know, we've been appeasing Putin for quite a while. Uh, again, you know, that's, you can say that's a parallel, but uh, actually, there are lots of things which aren't parallel. So, for example. The, the time period between when, you know, all the appeasement was going on in 1938 and when the, the Germans finally moved in was only six months, whereas we're talking, you know, from when Crimea was annexed all the way through to now, that's more like eight years. So there's, there's a difference there. But, um, you know, we have been appeasing uh, Putin. Um, uh we've allowed him to build up arms for a very very long time without really very much response on our side um so th there's things like that um immediately spring to mind i suppose sean 
Oh, my next? Oh, perfect. Actually, no, I was just thinking I could roll with this appeasement theme. I wanted to talk about Poland, as I was telling you before we went on, partly because I'm drinking a Polish beer. Perhaps in honor of everything Poland is doing uh, for Ukrainian refugees. I actually have a friend who's in Krakow right now helping to resettle refugees. I guess Krakow being a city of about three quarters of a million and already more than a million refugees have passed through, wow. which is quite interesting. But you know, it's, uh, I have a slightly counterintuitive take on all this. The reason I've been thinking a lot about Poland is actually that, although again, the story of appeasement, it obviously, there there's some very clear parallels there. You have kind of irredentism, this revisionist power, Putin's Russia, been trying to, to kind of recapitulate or reform the old empire in the same way Hitler's trying to kind of restore some of Germany's boundaries, expand out using the German minorities as an excuse. Putin, you, you see all that. The thing about Poland, though, that I don't think it's always necessarily uh, understood or appreciated is that between 1934 and 1939, Poland and Germany were actually fairly close. Um, not not necessarily best friends, but but cooperating in a lot of ways. They actually cooperated at Munich, where Poland actually helped to slice off Czechoslovak territory in Teschen alongside Germany. And up until, really, Chamberlain's guarantee to Poland, the, the somewhat ill-fated notorious guarantee of March, Poland and Germany, they had been negotiating. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more bullying on the German side, but that is, they had been negotiating. And so the parallel that I see, which is a little bit more, more painful and awkward, is that although Chamberlain is so often pilloried for appeasement, you know, I think understandably so. Uh, he really does veer rather dramatically. I mean, almost like a pendulum swing, completely the op opposite extreme uh, with, with the guarantee and then the policy in 1939, where it's almost like this kind of mindless confrontation that frankly doesn't really make sense. You know, as we know, uh, Poland, the territory is very difficult to defend. She ends up getting invaded from five directions simultaneously, not unlike Ukraine recently being in, invaded in about five directions simultaneously. But the thing is, there was this kind of false security umbrella, right? The guarantee, which the Poles think is a guarantee. They think Britain's actually going to help. Of course, in the end, Britain doesn't really help. They don't really even get arms to Poland. They don't really even get loans to Poland. France doesn't really do anything in the end. There's this kind of false security umbrella. And, and frankly, I think that's part of Ukraine's painful agony today, is that since 2014, and even to some extent, even going back to the talk of joining NATO, which began as early as 2008, there has been this almost pretense that uh, NATO and the United States are going to extend this security guarantee to Ukraine, whether or not it's a full-on nuclear umbrella, Article 5 NATO protection, but obviously getting arms to Ukraine. In that sense, they actually did more to help Ukraine than the Allies did for Poland in 1939. But, you know, a real provocation, frankly. I mean, you know, frankly, the, the U.S. and its allies got far more deeply involved in Ukraine than, than Britain and France really did in Poland. I mean, they never really did offer Poland very much. Um, it was kind of... Uh, you know, all provocation and no deterrence. Uh, whereas with Ukraine, I suppose there's been a lot of provocation, a little bit of deterrence, but obviously not enough. And then these contrary signals, I guess, uh, both with the, the, the botch of the withdrawal from Afghanistan and then more recently the Biden administration, I think there was the phrase they used that a, a minor incursion might not occasion a decisive response. It's kind of the worst of all worlds. Uh, massive uh, diplomatic and political provocation, but no real deterrence. Um, so I think the really painful parallel is what happens to Poland in 1939. Of course, the story doesn't end well. I mean, it turns out okay, I suppose, for Britain and France after six years of World War. Poland, of course, is bludgeoned completely and just destroyed mm. in um, You know, Poland is, is, a, is a smoking ruin by the end of the war, and I certainly hope it doesn't turn out that badly for Ukraine. But there's obviously already some, you know, some images we're seeing that are quite disturbing. Sure. David, I'll, I'll go over to you for your take on this. Sure. I mean, I, I, I think following on from, from Keith and Sean, I mean, some of the parallels we see, I, I mean, obviously I've been interested in the in the, the Finnish Soviet war for the last couple of years and just some of the parallels. It's a it's a war really within World War Two. And when we can see some of the pressure mounting on Finland, really from the mid 1930s um, and it's obviously at this stage, it's Stalin's Russia. But very much, uh, you can see in Putin's recent activities on the Ukraine, uh, similarities in the game plan, similarities in the menu that he's choosing from. Um, I mean, Stalin, you know, the USSR was trying to divert uh, Finland from Western alliances, particularly with Germany. Uh, there's there's mounting there's mounting kind of diplomatic pressure on Finland and also the other Baltic states, and all of these territories are back in the news again. I mean, in, in the last in the last few weeks, we've seen a debate begin in Finland about uh, joining NATO. I mean, this has been an ongoing debate throughout the Cold War. It obviously has attention again. And I think the latest opinion poll in Finland uh, places about 62% of the country believe that it should go into NATO. 
um, and Putin has promised military and political uh, repercussions if they do. Uh, so we, it, has, it has a terrible 1930s feel about it, and that kind of the mounting intimidation, um, and you know the, the reference to say ethnic Russians within in the kind of like the Finnish uh, Russian, the Finnish Soviet kind of like border areas, um, the kind of the idea that Finland is in trawl to other Western states, particularly Nazi Germany, um, and then when the, the attack does come, it opens with air attacks on civilians. Essentially, the the opening gambit is. Is a bombing attack into Helsinki, uh, but then also multiple land attacks in four different directions, uh, from north to south in, into into Finnish territory. Uh, I think it's interesting as well. We've we've all been waiting. I suppose you know one of the most common things students ask me is why is the United Nations why isn't the West making uh, more of an effort? Why isn't it making kind of like greater interventionary kind of actions? Um, very similar again to to Poland's condition in the 1939-40 period. I mean. You know, essentially at this stage, the League of Nations has had its day. You know, it's it, it centers Soviet Russia. It expels Soviet Russia, but that's that's meaningless to Stalin and Soviet Russia. So, I mean, the powerlessness of the international community, um, and similarly as in the Polish situation, we have French and British discussion about intervention and expeditionary, uh, you know, forces going to Sweden and from Sweden to Finland to help, but nothing comes of that. So Finland stands very much alone in all of this. So, you know, we, we should tell, we tell our students that history doesn't repeat itself, but definitely I think there are kind of like similarities in the whole, the whole kind of like mood music of the 30s, late 30s, and what we're seeing now. So one of the things I, I, I'd kind of like to get your impression of, there's this, there's this disconnect. Uh, Putin and I guess a lot of Russians feel that Ukraine isn't even a legitimate country, that they're really just misguided Russians. And then you have the Ukrainians who very much are, we are a nation. So, I mean, where the, where does this notion that, that Ukraine isn't even a legitimate country come from? Because it just seems so in opposition to what's happening. How are they, you know, I guess a little background would, would probably be helpful. Should, well, should, I mean, I'll, should I, who's going to leap in? Shall I, shall I leap in? Oh, I'll leap in. I mean, the... um. Uh, the idea of Ukraine has been around for a long time. Uh, it, it's certainly an, um, in the 19th century when all lots of countries that didn't exist in the 19th century, they're all part of empire, sort of had a, 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 a sort of a, a, an awakening in at the end of the 19th century. And Ukraine was one of those, just like Slovakia and, and Czech Republic and, and all those other places that came out of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Ukraine was uh what we now call ukraine was kind of split between the austro-hungarian empire on one side and the and the, the russian empire on the other uh around sort of 1905 1906 i suppose there was um uh a, a lot of students who uh formed um uh ukrainian societies and universities and so on trying, trying to sort of bring this idea of national consciousness to the fore uh, they started uh, pub publishing um, Ukrainian language newspapers and, and so on. So the Tsar at the time cracked down on this, banned Ukrainian publications and said, no, there's no such thing as Ukraine. You're just part of the Russian Empire. Uh, things were a little easier in the in the Austro-Hungarian bit where there was a they w did allow a lot of the Ukrainian language stuff and Ukrainian uh, cultural stuff to go ahead. Then you get the First World War and everything's thrown up in the air. All the empires are all broken up. And as the First World War comes to an end, Ukrainian nationalists see their opportunity and they do create a Ukraine. Uh, there are a couple of different kinds of Ukraine. Uh, and, and at one point they unite uh, and, and form, say, you know, we're going to be one Ukraine together. Unfortunately, you've got the Poles fighting against them from one direction, the Bolsheviks fighting against them from the other direction, and between them, uh, by the beginning of the 20s, they've, they've split Ukraine again. So there was actually a Ukraine in 1918, 1919. Uh, so anybody who says that um, it's, it's only just ex begun to exist since 1991, 1992, is ignoring lots of things which has happened in the past. Again, in the Second World War, there was another uh, opportunity for Ukrainian nationalists to try and reawaken this idea of having their own country again. 
They had a chance when Hitler invaded. Uh, that didn't come to anything. When the Germans retreated again, they tried again, but then the Soviets moved in and stopped them once again. So, you know, they, it, there's, they've been repeatedly trying to create their own country for over a century. And then finally, in the 90s, they get it. Um, I, I mean, there's, there's other intermediate points as well. Of course, the Ukraine is made a separate country under the uh, kind of a separate, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, a, a, a republic, a Soviet republic um, is created after the Second World War to, to um, a, and has its own place in the United Nations after the Second World War as, as a separate country, um, which Stalin, he, he personally intervened, said, no, you must make... Um, Ukraine a separate country because he wanted another vote. Uh, right. right. Now, if, I, so, if, if I can, um, if I can kind of roll with this, I mean, this is definitely, I think, a, an excellent exposition of the Ukrainian point of view um, to understand the Russian perspective and what Putin's getting at. Uh, and he actually spoke at great length about this, of course, in the speeches, both on February 21st, February 24th, and also the now notorious article last summer about the alleged historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians. He did talk about 1917, 1918. He just has a very different interpretation. Um, I mean, what is interesting about the story uh, is a lot of it actually begins with Lenin, and Lenin was singled out uh, by Putin in these speeches. Um, he left a few of the details out, which I, I would love to fill in here if I can. Uh, Lenin actually first came to the attention of the Central Powers when he was in a town now called Paronin, uh, which is essentially kind of near Krakow and what is now Poland, but of course was then part of the Austro-Hungarian or Habsburg Empire, and he was actually agitating amongst local Ukrainians. Uh, it was actually Lenin's advocacy of Ukrainian autonomy from the Tsarist Empire, which of course was a kind of a cause, as we've been hearing, uh, kind of particularly among progressive students, etc. at the time, uh, that Lenin was actually uh, essentially kind of given the, the royal treatment, first by Austria-Hungary and then by Germany, set up in Switzerland, and then famously, of course, he goes on this so-called sealed train car car across Germany. In fact, it wasn't sealed. He got out of the train on numerous occasions inside Germany. And according to eyewitnesses, he gave some stump speeches um, urging Ukrainian autonomy at German uh, insistence. Um, and what does actually then happen, um, Stalin plays a role too. Amazingly, uh, Stalin, then nationalities commissar, uh, and Lenin actually co-signed a degree essentially inviting the minority peoples of what had been the Russian Empire to declare autonomy, if not independence. This is as early as November 1917, which they probably do. Ukraine, obviously, among them, and, and the Rada is formed in, in Kiev, and the Rada is then uh, enjoined or allowed to send delegates to Brest-Litovsk. And in fact, the Germans signed a peace treaty not first with Russia, but with Ukraine. They signed a peace treaty with the Rada, with these kind of student delegates of Ukraine. And so from Putin's perspective, that of kind of a Russian nationalist, Ukraine was first an artificial creation of Lenin. He hates Lenin, modern Russian nationalists. They see Lenin as, as the nation destroyer, the one who tore down the Russian Empire. And second, basically, of German imperialism. Now, I'm not saying this is the correct interpretation. I'm saying this is how the Russians see it. And even the Second World War, of course, I mean, this is very, this is very fraught subject material. Uh, many Ukrainians had a very good reason, of course, for, uh, for opposing Stalin and his regime, particularly after the Holodomor, all the wars of the early 1930s, with the kind of the terror or the hunger famine. Um, and partly because of that, many of them, of course, either supported or collaborated with the invader, um, not just Germans, Romanians were also, of course, invading their country, and the Ukrainians were kind of given differential treatment, and some of them were actually allowed to, to go even after they were captured. Uh, there's a lot of talk today about the, the so-called Banderites of Stepan Bandera. Amazingly, some of this actually goes back even earlier. Before Bandera, there was another character called uh, Pitlura, Simeon Pitlura, uh, who was another kind of Ukrainian, you might say nationalist, who actually invited Poland to effectively to invade Ukraine. This is the start of the, the Soviet-Polish War in 1920. Effectively, it was kind of Ukraine and Poland teaming up against the Bolsheviks. And, you know, usually in that kind of scenario, I would fully root for Poland and Ukraine against the Bolsheviks. It's important, though, to keep in mind that uh, Russians have long memories for this kind of thing. You know, that's why they're always going on and on, banging on and on about, you know, Ukrainian uh, Banderites and fascists and, and Nazis and neo-Nazis and all the rest of it. You know, they, they have a very different interpretation, of obviously one-sided one in the other direction of the events of the 20th century, you know, where they, they see Ukraine as kind of this cat's paw of hostile foreign powers, whether Poland or Germany or later on NATO, you know, so that's kind of how, how the Russian nationalists of today view it. 
David, did you want to chime in on this? Sure. I mean, I, there's, there's very little I can add to that. I think it was just uh, the recent, you know, Putin references and, and history lectures have been uh, extremely interesting uh, for so many respects. And, you know, a lot of debate in kind of like not only Western media, but Western academics and whether or not he's correct in his history. Uh, at the some respect, it strikes me that it's, uh, it doesn't matter whether he is or he isn't. Uh, he believes he is. And he can he seems to be quite adept at actually convincing a decent proportion of the russians that he's correct as well the russian population um but it just strikes me we have we have uh, different mentalities and approaches to ukrainian history and probably history in general we see the end of of the imperial russia the end of the, the romanov empire and we, we compartmentalize that we see the soviet period and we see that collapse in the 90s and we compartmentalize that um and we, we, we look upon Ukraine as an emerging Western nation. Um, and what's become very ob obvious from uh, Putin's stance in this, he has a two or a 300 year perspective on this. He's looking back even into Imperial Russian times. And as Sean was saying, he has this long view, this long perception that seems to be full of uh, grudges and issues that he's still holding. Uh, despite the fact that the various Russian regimes that were engaged in, in, in kind of like long historic activity are gone, uh, but he still seems to subscribe to these ideas, which is just fascinating. And Chris, if I'd known that that Putin was so into history, we could have, you know, invited him. I would have. <laughs> although I'm not sure how the internet in and out of Russia is going mm. right now. So he, sure. he actually wrote a very long article on the Second World War back in tw in summer of 2020, even before really? the. Article. Mm -hmm. Office is a very one-sided interpretation, mind you. You know, I'm, I'm not saying I endorse Putin's interpretation of yeah. this thing, but uh, Dave is absolutely—he takes this very seriously. I mean, he's a perhaps a either a cavalier or a, a sort of a selective student of history, but he is a very serious student of history. Well, how interesting! Well, I, 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 on, on the Finnish case, he made this ominous comment there a few years ago that, like, he was explained there was a there was a, a, a winter war commemoration, and he, he made some remark that it had broken out because of mistakes of 1918. And you know, you know, when, when the Duchy of Finland disappeared, and you had the new Finland, uh, and it's just, you know, people had to check, had to actually go back and try and discover what the hell is he talking about. But he's he's looking back beyond the century. Um, I'd love to see his library. I'd love to see his library. <laughs> <laughs> Is, uh... I, I wanted to ask uh, you, David, actually, uh, about uh, parallels with the Winter War because it does seem that. Um, uh, you know, the Putin's invasion of Ukraine has stuttered in the same way that the Soviet invasion of the, the of Finland, which was supposed to go swimmingly, it was supposed to be an easy thing, and and just broke down very, uh, it became very protracted. Is it, are there similarities there? But, I mean, yeah. I mean, operationally, tactically, there are, and I've I've tried. I mean, I try not to push that button too much in the last few weeks because I was just waiting for everything to change from the Russian side. But those, I mean, those long columns outside Kiev. 20, 40, 60 kilometers, uh, depending on what source you read. Very similar to those columns that go into Finland, 39, 40, get hung up in, in around what we usually look at the rat road as the major one, and then get chopped up and destroyed. Um, you know, basically those columns we were seeing outside. And similar reasons, you know, collapse in command and control, collapse in logistics, um, very, very similar. And even in terms of, let's say, issues, say, of air power, uh, the Soviet Army goes in, the Soviet Air Force goes in with huge, on paper, superiority, uh, but cannot make that felt on the ground tactically for a whole load of different reasons. So, yes, I mean, it's 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 impossible not draw, to draw parallels and maybe even get a bit excited that this could go the same way that, you know, you know, Ukraine, Ukraine 22 could end up as the same as Finland 39. I should point out for people who don't know that war, the, the Finns actually lost it. <laughs> but well, I was just going to say that, and despite the parallels, that, that yeah. we shouldn't forget the Russians ended up winning the war. Yeah. And, and effectively, Britain and France, as David was saying earlier, really were on the cusp of intervention, and Stalin kind of pulled the rug out from under them with effectively kind of suing for peace. And yes, perhaps it was not as punitive as it might have been otherwise, but the Soviets had clearly restored their position and won the initiative. And, and frankly, I mean, I, I saw this one communication from Mannerheim. I think it, it was Mannerheim communicating internally, not 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 to Britain and France necessarily. But you, know, you basically said that, you know, if things go on like this for another month or two, we're, we're going to run out of people. You know, they just, they won't have anyone left. Um, and, you know, obviously Ukraine's population is much 
larger. I mean, Finland had, what, 3 million odd people. Ukraine obviously got about 40 million plus, although now declining, of course. So they have a, a larger manpower base. But, you know, the, the peril is not necessarily quite as encouraging one as I think sometimes people might, might first think. You know, it is a war where the Soviets uh, are kind of humiliated, but in the end they bludgeon their way through and, and they do impose a kind of diktat peace and, you know, retain, the, in their view, a sort of a veto power, even if Finland later joins the Germans and invades the Soviet Union. In the end, Finland is quote unquote Finlandized, of course, in the Cold War. That is, Finland loses effectively full control over her foreign policy. So again, the parallel is not necessarily that edifying, you know, for those who are, you know, hoping for a positive outcome for Ukraine. <laughs> um, I, I want to show you guys a map. Um, and and I, I found this, I think I, I think I found it on Facebook uh, someplace, this amazing map uh, from Look Magazine from March 14th 1939, which is actually the day before Hitler takes Czechoslovakia. And I don't know if you can see the headline at the top that says the next European war will start in the Ukraine. N not correct, but still uh, uh, interesting that that was their take on it. Um, and uh, this is about six months before Poland uh, is invaded by Nazi Germany. There's a lot of stuff on the map uh, to take in. I love over the black area there underneath the uh, uh, Sudetenland of Czechoslovakia, it says, this was Austria, uh, which are pretty chilling words there. Um, but this map brings to mind for me the question, you know, why has Ukraine been at the epicenter, as you have guys discussed, of war and genocide so many times in the last century or so? Uh, World War One, the Russian-Polish War, World War Two, the, the of course the man-made famine imposed by Stalin's regime, uh, and now um, uh, uh, you know Putin's wars with uh, uh, with first with Crimea and now now in Ukraine. Is it simply a matter of geography? Is it strong independence movements arising in Ukraine? Or is there something else that would help us to understand this better and, and figure out why this keeps happening, things keep happening to Ukraine? Hmm. <laughs> it's such I, a, I, I'd be but, happy to jump into Keith, do you want to go? No, 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 you go ahead, yeah. you go ahead. Well, I mean, obviously, geography plays plays a huge part. You're talking about a classic borderland. I mean, literally, if you talk about the, the translation of what Ukraine means, it's effectively it's kind of a frontier a borderland, buffer state, obviously, in between. Usually, at least, you know, unless you're counting when Kiev and Rus was its own empire, you know, the, the early modern to modern period, you're talking about the clash or the collision of these various empires, whether the Habsburgs, the the Romanovs, uh, later on the Hohenzollerns, the Germans, and then of course Hitler's empire. That's obviously part of it, it's a simple geography, but you shouldn't forget the resources. You know, we're talking about the breadbasket of Europe. So when the Germans go in there in 1918, I know people forget this, but you know, Hitler didn't get his ideas about the Lebanon's realm from nowhere. The Germans actually occupied Ukraine in 1918. And in fact, they sent scouting parties as far east as Tsaritsyn on the Volga, the city later known as Stalingrad. They were there in 1918. Um, they didn't get everything they wanted out of it. In fact, they went in precisely because it was the breadbasket, and they were hoping to feed Hungary, Berlin, and Vienna, to some extent, Bulgaria, and the Ottoman Empire, the Central Powers, who were all kind of in various degrees of starvation, food shortages, etc. Uh, so they wanted the foodstuffs, they wanted the grain, they wanted the wheat, they wanted the corn. In the end, they didn't get a lot because the Ukrainians kind of took a pox in all your houses approach to this. Um, but it's not just those resources, of course. You're talking about massive amounts of iron ore uh you're talking about coal you're talking about manganese um you're talking about oil you're talking about uh just tremendous varieties of uh, the zaporozhia you're talking about aluminum smelting combines in the case of the germans in the second world war so heavy industry particularly in the eastern half of ukraine but not exclusively there's a lot in the west as well um resources today we're hearing a lot about uh, fertilizer in addition to foodstuffs effectively being cut off from world markets because ukraine's ports are closed so it's also it's kind of like a, a resource cauldron where uh, ukraine is just it's just critical really to, to that part of the world it's critical to the russians above all i mean that my old advisor norman stone had a line about ukraine which is very quotable you know he said with ukraine russia's the united states She's a superpower. Without Ukraine, uh, she's Canada, mostly snow. And perhaps, perhaps it's not entirely fair to Canada, uh, but there's something to it. It's not just the population and the land. It's actually the resources and the industrial potential of the place. And we shouldn't forget that, that Putin, as far as his view of the world, um, his uh, doctoral dissertation, unless I have this wrong, actually had to do with mineral resources and state power. Um, and so he's been thinking about 
this. I don't think there's any doubt about that. In the same way the Germans were. If you look at the German plans in 1941, I actually examined some of this in great detail in Freiburg in the military archives. They had extremely detailed files on exactly what types of factories and industry were located where in Ukraine. They knew where all the iron ore was. They knew where the manganese was. They knew where the coal was. And they wanted all of it. Um, you know, they, they thought they wouldn't be able to basically kind of fight this world war. Um, of course, yeah, they probably would have been better off with the cooperation that they had with the Soviets when the Soviets were sending all this stuff to Germany during the molotov Ribbentrop period. They ended up shooting themselves in the foot, uh, both in 1918 and, and in 1941, you might say. Um, but So it's not just the location. I think it's also the, the resources and the proverbial breadbasket. <laughs> It is, once there it show. is, once per show. <laughs> Keith, do you want to add to that? Oh, I mean, only to say that, uh, you know, we, we all come from countries which uh, have very nicely defined borders, don't we? I mean, Britain is, is an island. Uh, Ireland is, is an island. Uh, the USA is effectively an island. You've got an ocean on either side. So there are very clear um, geographical barriers uh, preventing invasions coming back with the port. Uh, Ukraine. I mean, there's there's some rivers. There's a there's a sea in the in the south. There's a few mountains here and there, um, but large large swathes of it. The reason why it's the breadbasket of Europe is because it's big, wide open, and flat. So it's it's sort of easy to invade, uh, which which you know helps, I suppose, <laughs> <laughs> or, or hinders if you're Ukrainian. David, I don't want to. I don't want to leave you out if you want to no, add something, no. but you don't have to. No, no. I, I mean, <laughs> I do. I do. No, I was just thinking about Ireland. Ireland is an island, and how that has protected us, uh, protected us against. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's how much. Hey, yeah, yeah. Hey, listen, listen. You know, I won't bring it up. You know, England lost the rugby last night, so. <laughs> And um, yeah, no, this not. I mean, I can't really add much more to that, except I think again, if you look at and the way Putin is taking that long history, different regimes in 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 in, uh, in Russia. I mean, um, I mean, when you think back, I mean, what kind of what Russian leader in in history, going back from Putin and through Yeltsin, Gorbachev, and on the way back, what kind of uh, Russian leader would have been comfortable with Ukraine pointing itself to the West? Or becoming involved in Western alliances and NATO, I would say none. And all the way back to the the imperial regime, they always seem to, and it's 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 all that territory. It's not only Ukraine; it's Poland, it's the Baltic states, it's Finland. That they always seem to want to put that nice geographical suede between them and mm -hmm. Germany, or them and Prussia, or Austro-Hungary. They they like the idea of that buffer zone, um, and I think you know the the fact that the the borders are a bit amorphous that these territories go in and out of different other empires just plays into that idea that this is look this is territory you know sean was saying as it, you know it, it is resource rich agriculturally it's resource rich but also if we get this and control this it puts a couple of hundred kilometers between us and our next nearest uh, enemy neighbor uh, so i think it has that kind of um, strategic attraction as well they just want it they're never going to let that I mean, even Gorbachev in the early 90s made it very, very clear, you know, you know, Ukraine and NATO was not going to happen. Um, we've known that long when we just took our eye off the ball a wee bit. Well, Bob, no, kind of picking up on that, though, one of the questions I had is why do you think that that Russia seems to be trapped in this notion? I mean, history has moved on. I mean, a lot of rocky sort of ways. The British no longer assume that Ireland's part of Great Britain and, you know, they've gotten over the fact that they're an independent country and the United States hasn't invaded Canada recently because we've accepted that Canada's good. Why do the Russians seem to still hang on to this notion that Eastern Europe is ours, either our borders there or we control everything that happens there and it will thus ever be. They don't seem, they seem almost trapped by this notion and I was kind of like to get your thoughts on that. Well. I think that the, the Sean brought up one of the the reasons certainly, um, uh, and and Sean leap in any moment. Um, uh, it's resentment. I mean, the the uh, you know the German resentment after losing the First World War and uh, was you know they they wanted they wanted it back. They wanted their their empire back. The Soviets lost the Cold War. Russia lost the Cold War, and they resent it. And and. Also, remember, we've had a massive uh, 
worldwide crash, much as like they um, had during the 20s and early 30s, and uh, and and that really affected. Um, well, I mean, R Russia was was really badly affected in the 90s, but also again in the in in the early 2000s. So, you know, there's a lot of resent resentment there, and mm -hmm. how do you get the people? back from that room you've got to give them sort of a sense of national pride well putin has chosen the same way that uh, they chose germany chosen the in the 30s get back your national pride by um saying the whole world's against us and we're gonna fight them fight back against them well, i think that's exactly right and it's just the the moments that if you look at what Putin's singling out in his speeches, he did talk briefly about 1917-18. It's not that he denies that it happens, it's just he thinks it was kind of this artificial uh, thing that happened at a moment of Russian imperial weakness and humiliation that briefly kind of Ukraine emerged or was midwifed into existence by the Germans or something. And then the same thing happens in 1991 with the humiliating collapse of the Soviet Union. And in fact, if, if you look really closely at, at the kind of thing that he and a lot of other Russian nationalists talk about, they talk about this thing they call the, the Bilovision betrayal. Um, and so what this was, was in early December 1991, after the failed coup of August, but before Gorbachev kind of officially um, you know, gives a power and the Soviet Union is officially dissolved, uh, three of the original four kind of signatory founding countries of the USSR, they didn't include uh, the Transcaucasian Federative Republic, but they did include Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia famously. So you had uh, Shushkevich and Kravchuk and Yeltsin. And according to a story, which is actually quite plausible, Yeltsin was actually drunk and passed out on the couch while this happened, you know, while they effectively dissolved the Soviet Union. You know, so there was actually this phrase that went around, you know, three men split a bottle and millions got a headache. And, you know, that's one of the things Putin was alluding to, that famous speech about the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century and all of this. You know, they, they feel like, yeah, it happened, but it somehow was kind of... Um, either legitimate or at this moment of kind of maximum weakness. And, and even when uh, Russia guarantees Ukraine's borders in the Budapest Memorandum of 1994 in exchange for Ukraine, faithfully and perhaps mistakenly, of course, forfeiting her nuclear arsenal, which then at the time was third largest in the world, they feel like to 1994, I mean, this is a time when, you know, Russia's in the middle of kind of like gangland warfare, you know, between the new mafiosi and the IMF and the World Bank and all these Western bankers are sort of descending on the corpse of Russia. and. And you know the mail order bride business is getting going, and they're just humiliations galore being heaped upon Russians. And you know they now associate that whole period of the 90s with kind of humiliation, degradation, exploitation by the West. And Ukraine's independence, unfortunately, is part of that, at least in the Russian psyche. Even though obviously Ukrainians feel very differently, they feel like this was finally our chance to to become free, to you know not to be oppressed by by the Russians. Um, and yet that's how the Russians see it. It's kind of this moment of maximum weakness and humiliation. And you know, the same thing about the, the famous promise, even if it was not put on paper, that NATO would not expand one inch east. The Russians feel like, you know, the West also made this promise, which they then broke with, with NATO expansion. Um, but absolutely, this kind of revanchism, very similar to interwar Germany, you know, and, and I, I think the feeling was we're no longer that weak. And so now we can, you know, kind of rewrite the history book and, and, and go back and do things the way we wish they had been done the first time. Unfortunately, a lot of people have to pay the price for it. Yeah, I, I think I think it's interesting that uh, that Ukraine declared their independence uh, in the same month that um, uh, the Russian parliament was being bought. You know, there was a coup going on. Right. But they, you know, while the coup is going on, you know, in the background, Ukraine are taking advantage and, and declaring their independence. And, and they have a referendum in December, like moments before the whole of the Soviet Union is going to dissolve. So they, they really picked their moment and they, they took it with both hands. Yeah. You know, the, the comparison with World War II can be a treacherous one with different factions pulling different World War II heartstrings for all they're worth. And I stole that quote literally from an email from Keith Lowe. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so I'll ask him to respond to this, right? That you can, that people uh, can also use, you know, just in the way that uh, Putin has kind of weaponized history and looking back 300 years and finding excuses for everything he's done. It's possible and probable that all sorts of other people are doing so as well in this. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that, Keith? Or have I stolen everything? Did I steal the entire <laughs> thought? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I would say that uh, yeah, it, it's easy to, you, you can always find parallels, uh, but they're never exact parallels. So, you know, you, 
to say that, that you know the, this, the idea that this is kind of like Munich well it's sort of not like Munich because uh, uh, you know that was about Czechoslovakia but actually the invasion of Czechoslovakia was unopposed uh, it was it was really Poland where it, it, it you know the military thing kicked off um, uh, the big difference now of course is we've got nuclear weapons now they didn't have then so I mean that's a fairly massive deterrent to to the West stepping in in a way that there, there wasn't that sort of deterrent in in 1939 so if you take the parallels too far you can yeah I mean it might lead you to sort of make some mistaken assumptions and I don't know hopefully not act mistakenly well, I was going to say, and I, I kind of get to get all, all, all the guests get all of your responses. Do we are we kind of hampering our understanding of what's happening by seeing it through the lens of World War II? We seem to, and I say this as a World War II historian. Do we tend to rely on that too much, or is that a good place to start to try to understand what's happening? Is it, is it muddying our view or, or clarifying it? Will I will I hop in there? Yeah. yeah. Hop in. <laughs> I, I think it. I think it is hugely important. I mean, I think we can see from what Putin's mindset, what he said. He's constantly, you know, blowing the dog whistle about Nazis because obviously he recognizes that within Russia, that regardless of what opposition he gets or doubt he may have internally, if he pushes the Nazi word with the resonances of the Great Patriotic War, that will actually immediately generate some support from. And he, you know, he's playing into some of the dubious activity in Ukraine during World War Two. He's playing on the this Azov battalion that seems to be extremely right wing. So he can he can he can punch that button, and we need to be aware of that. Um, but I think it's just part of the. He has a historical buffet, and I think it's just part of the historical buffet. He will put an, he's putting an accent on this at the moment, Nazification, denazification. Uh, but I think we've discussed tonight there are other longer issues there in his mind as well. Anybody, anybody else? That? Sean, you want to jump in? There? Sure. No, I mean, I, Keith was making a really interesting point about the difference uh, in terms of kind of obviously the nuclear arsenal that both the West and Russia have today. I mean, that makes it all the more striking to me. I mean, even surprising that despite not having to worry about nuclear retaliation, that Britain and France did so little for Poland in 1939. Whereas, in fact, today, despite the dangers of um, what might happen if, if a no-fly zone is declared over nuclear Ukraine, that sort of thing, or even the Russians appearing to target some of these kind of transit facilities in western Ukraine, where some of the arms, equipment, and volunteers are coming in from Poland. I'm actually kind of amazed the West has gotten as deeply involved as it has, you know, despite the fact that obviously Zelensky and Ukraine would like the West to get more involved. Obviously, there are risks, and I personally am quite glad that they haven't yet declared a no-fly zone and started directly shooting Russian warplanes down from the sky, that a shooting war between NATO and Russia hasn't broken out yet. Um, but as to that question about the World War II parallel, I, I actually do think it's important. Again, not that you know, history repeats itself exactly or anything like that, but again, the lesson we normally draw is Munich, oh, well, you must stand up to dictators and aggressors and all the rest of it you know first of all i'm not actually sure that's what happened exactly in 1939 i mean it's a little bit like over learning the lessons of going almost too far in the other direction where you issue a security guarantee you don't actually mean to enforce in the case of, of chamberlain in, in france um while ignoring kind of contrary indicators um there's also the fact that again it doesn't work out well for poland i mean here's the thing it's like there there's a certain angle here where you look at all this and you say oh well look it will be great if this war drags on long from the Western perspective. You know, you can bleed the Russians and destroy their equipment and they'll run out of missiles. And I mean, frankly, there was a piece in Foreign Affairs that came out the day after the invasion by a former CIA officer who basically said, you know, let's turn Ukraine into Afghanistan. And I wonder whether you should maybe ask the Ukrainians whether they want Ukraine to turn into Afghanistan. Right. That is a long term insurgency, you know, pouring in as much lethal weapons, more stinger missiles. That's the obvious parallel. But then you also have these, you know, the kind of the, the drones that are coming in. And I'm sure that might prolong the conflict. Maybe Ukraine could salvage a little bit more territory in some way. But if, if the war does drag on for months and months and more of the infrastructure is destroyed and several million more people leave Ukraine, and of course, who knows how many tens or hundreds of thousands of people will die. You know, I don't know if that's in the interest of Ukrainians. Whereas, again, you look at World War II, yeah, Poles can look back today and say, you know, we're proud, we were the first to fight, we stood up to both Nazi aggression, we shouldn't fit the Soviets invaded from the East too. Great, you know, bully for Poland, but how well did it actually work out for Poland? You know, Poland 
Poland was never compensated. She never got reparations from Germany or Russia. Uh, I mean, it's, it's shocking. I, I learned this a few years back. I couldn't believe it. I had to look it up. No, it's true. In 2017, the Polish government petitioned Berlin for reparations because of the Second World War. And the chancellor's office said, no, you forfeited your right in 1953, you know, when Poland was an occupied Soviet satellite state. You know, So Poland does recover eventually, six or seven decades later. Um, you know, but it's not a very positive or rosy scenario for Ukraine, you know, which is to say, I think if you learn any lesson, it's that, you know, war is absolutely horrible and really leads nowhere good. And to the extent we have any influence at all, I think I think we should we should do something to mediate a settlement. You know, I'm not sure how how we can do it and what the terms would be. Um, but I wish we were kind of thinking a little more seriously about that, a little bit less seriously about how to make ourselves feel good about yeah. standing up in some heroic way to to aggression. Well, I, you know, we have a, a, some questions from the audience. I'll just throw one of them up here. I have to just roll back and, and find it here um, from uh, Doug McCord. And he's, he's seeing a parallel, and this is one, something I hadn't heard before, which is why I'm, I'm pulling up this question, uh, about the response of the Catholic Church, or he says the non-response of the Catholic Church to the invasion of the Ukraine today compared to their response to the invasion of Poland in 1939. Now, in fairness, the you know there there has been some response. The Pope has uh, decried the war. He's not you know hidden and not spoken about it. He visited recently with uh, uh, orphan Ukrainian children in um, in Rome. But there is you know I, I guess one could look at at uh, the response from both the Catholic Church and the rest of the world to this. Um, how does it compare? How is it different from uh, from the period of, of uh, World War II? And, 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 and how much of that is, in fact, as was brought up and mentioned by a couple of our guests, you know, nuclear weapons involved with that? Mm. There's no small questions. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 30 seconds or less. <laughs> yeah. Yes or no? Up or down? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I run with the Catholic Church. I just think it, uh, it no longer has the credibility to stand up as a moral voice. And that's, uh, you know, when I, I speak from somebody coming from a country that was dominated by the Catholic Church throughout the 20th century. Uh, and we're still unpacking the baggage of that. I mean, yeah. if, if we if we seriously got into some into some, uh, you know, kind of like government inquiries about this, we have had some in the past. Um, there are a couple of more that need to happen. Um, and I just think it, there's, there's been a collapse in the moral authority of the Catholic Church in the last 20 years. So as a, as a voice coming out to talk about this, I just think it has no credibility. I, I'm not That's sure. About, I'm, I'm not sure about what the, the Catholic response was in 1939. I mean, they, they weren't particularly um, uh, friendly towards uh, Bolsheviks and, and communists. Um, so uh, I, I don't know how much they, how much do they, I, I actually I think it was a, I think it was a non response. I mean, I think the, the, the in, in Pope did they respond at all? I mean, they really no. didn't. The Pope didn't uh, I mean Germany had uh, uh, had uh, you know imprisoned uh, some Roman Catholic priests. There was a lot of hostility to Roman Catholicism in Germany. Uh, and the Pope, you know, I think famously didn't get in, involved with that, didn't really get involved with the Holocaust, really just kind of kept a very low profile uh, in Rome and didn't do anything. Because in 1945, they did intervene quite a lot on behalf of, uh, of uh, you know, people who had been invaded by the Soviets, uh, yeah. uh, the fight against... Yeah, it's um, a bit late communism. there, they, for, yeah. <laughs> in that so, point so, of view. They, they, were quite, quite, they were quite vociferous against the, when the Soviets were doing it, but not necessarily when the Germans were do, going the other way earlier on. Uh, so, so one, one question, or one thing I'd like to raise is, as we're, you know, reading all the news reports and we're trying to understand this, um, I'm not an expert on this topic. Most people aren't. You three are. Um, are there things that the collective we are not considering when we're trying to understand what happened? Is there is there is there something that when you read the news reports, you're just like biting your tongue, like, well, wait, what about this? Or you haven't? Are there things that we're not really considering when we're trying to? digest all of this i it, i think maybe just kind of because in a way turn my turn here going in, in, in the circle maybe i'll just jump in first but no i do think the biggest 
the biggest gap, I think, in the coverage in the West and almost this this kind of astonishment with which everyone greeted the news of the invasion, even though obviously it was a long lead up and talk about the Russian troop buildup, is the idea that I think most people have in the West that this war just suddenly began on February 24th, 2022. Um, you know, it's something where if you were living in either Ukraine or Russia, you would have been aware that obviously there's been a slow burning conflict, whether you call it a kind of quasi civil war, or intergovernmental war, a war in the Donbass in particular. Um, I know Russians have been seeing, uh, Ukrainians have been seeing, both of them have been seeing you know, pictures of carnage on television going back almost eight years. Um, obviously, both sides have seen different versions of, of, of the story. You know, the Russians, the Russians think that there are these innocent women and children huddling in bomb shelters, you know, are being shelled by Ukrainian neo-Nazis or something like that. And, you know, again, there are grains of truth in this, distorted as it is. And Ukrainians think that, you know, the Russians have been you know, causing similar mayhem and damage to Ukrainian civilians, you know, for eight years. Years. And I mean, the, the UN estimates, for example, that um, in between what I think 2014 and 2021, something like 14,000 died in this conflict, and maybe there are 60,000 casualties, you know. And so this obviously is a very serious escalation what's happened since February. But I think to Russians and Ukrainians, it's a little bit more like a, a kind of a new chapter in an ongoing story. Whereas I think in the West, it's just, you know, people aren't really following the story. And so it kind of came as this bolt from the blue. And, you know, so the, I think that, that's part of where the disconnect is coming from, you know, this almost like completely different media channels. Um, you know, or in the West, this just, again, seemed like this you know, utterly unprovoked bolt from the blue, um, you know, whereas to the Ukrainians, sure, it was shocking, but they've kind of been dealing with it for eight years. And from the Russians, they kind of feel like, look, we've been at war already since 2014. Anybody else? Yeah, I think one thing that strikes me in a lot of the media coverage is this, uh, I mean, Putin's quite often referred to as mad. He's crazy, and this is mad, and he's deranged, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I think um, he may well be deluded, but I don't necessarily think he's mad. I think he has a strategy. He has a he has a plan that he's playing out to dismiss him as a crazy person. Uh, it's doing him a, a, a dis disservice, and we're actually putting ourselves at a disadvantage because at some stage uh, we're going to have to engage with that regime if we're going to actually close this thing down. Um, so I, that, that annoys me consistently. And I think coming back, as Sean was saying earlier on, this is not new. This is 2014 onwards. Um, and back then, it was very, very apparent that, amongst many other things, apart from ethnic Russians in Ukraine, uh, the question of the Crimea that they had built up as a naval base from the 19th century, that, that base is not going anywhere. But if that is staying in Russian hands, regardless of what happens. Um, we need to get our head around that as well. And factor that into things going forward. Um, oh, go ahead, Keith. Go ahead. No, I, I was just thinking that w one thing we should keep an eye on also is is how what happens to the populations in the areas which are under Russian control, because that's one of the uh, one of the things, uh, a potential parallel which we haven't necessarily seen much of yet. Uh, is how they treat those people and what, whether they do what they did in 45, 46, 47, which is round up populations that are, are difficult and might cause problems and start uh, deporting them to, you know, sort of Siberia, Kazakhstan, kind of uh, uh, away from the troubled areas. Um, that that might be something which starts happening. I, I pray it doesn't, but uh, so keep an eye on it. I, I, uh... As we approach the end of our end of our show, a last question here: Does does history give us any clue as to how this might end? And you've all written about this conflict, and I scrolled forward to the ends of articles you've written. I didn't see a lot of rosy scenarios there uh, for the outcome. Uh, and as and then as part of that question, you know, and again keeping it brief, any advice that you'd give to? Uh, uh, to uh, current uh, leaders, whether it's uh, Biden, Macron, Johnson, or or you know Zelensky, anybody else. So again, one one more big question to get through, and then I think we're we're on the home stretch. Uh, maybe we can go in reverse uh, <laughs> alphabetical order this time, just to get let Keith think a little bit about his answer <laughs> and and force David to actually go Part go Dave. first there. Oh well, yes, yeah, come to the Irishman for diplomacy. <laughs> My <laughs> um, I, I would say, I, I mean, as I think everybody, nobody sees a rosy outcome heading here. 
um, especially when we look at, I mean, there is some hope, I think, that, that both sides are talking now and there seems to have, they have identified some common areas they can actually talk talk about. Uh, but the two positions seem so irreconcilable. Um, I would suggest that, you know, from the West, we have to up the ante a wee bit. And I'm not talking about military aid, I think in terms of diplomacy, to try and move this towards a conclusion. If we don't, I, I think we are going to see a grassification of Ukraine. That we will see increasing focus on the urban centres, increasing destruction and death of civilians. And your, your grassification, you're talking about Grozny in uh, Chechnya. Grozny in Chechnya, yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, we all remember the last cycle of that, what was in 1999-2000, that Russia declared as a victory, uh, but the, the city had been laid to waste. Um, I think we need to up the ante in terms of the discussion to try and get both sides talking and moving towards diplomatic rather than military solution. Sean? Well, sure, maybe it's, maybe it's the Irish and me and the Irish colors here. Um, <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm, I'm fully on board with, with David here and some of the points that he's made also about, about Putin, I think, which is an important point. I, I think there's you know, this, this almost theme that's been going around in some of the Western, frankly, propaganda about this war, that, you know, that Putin is deranged, he's a madman, he's lost his mind, that if we hit them hard enough with the right type of targeted sanctions, I don't know, some of the Siloviki or so-called oligarchs are going to rise up and, and destroy Putin. Um, you know, I think, first of all, it's a fantasy. It's uh, it's a dangerous fantasy because, um, I mean, you, you, you just saw Putin, it was yesterday, the day before, at this massive, massive pro-war rally, just basking in the glow of the admiration of, obviously, not all Russians, there are many who oppose the war, as we know, and they, they definitely crack down on dissent. But, you know, the idea that, that, that Putin is, is somehow deeply unpopular and is about to be overthrown by some coup or that Russia is going to get kind of dismembered into its constituent parts. And I've heard a lot of talk of that nature since this war started or was escalated in late February. And I really think Western statesmen need, need to abandon some of these fantasies and as David was saying, just kind of deal with the fact that uh, that Russia exists, that Putin exists, that much as we might not like or approve of her, that, that Russia is a great power, a nuclear power to be reckoned with. And both for the sake of the people of Ukraine and also really for the sake of, uh, frankly, world peace, we should do everything that we can uh, to negotiate some type of a settlement here. And you know, I don't know if this means to some extent using whatever influence we have to lean on Zelensky and his government to you know, perhaps make not not fatal concessions, but at least to make some concessions in the direction of the settlement. Um, the other thing, just to remember, and we've, we've all touched on this to some direction or others, we talk about Russia, you know, being humiliated in the Winter War, Russia being, you can talk about Russia being humiliated in Grozny in 1996. We shouldn't forget Russia won both of those wars. You know, they may not be pretty, they may not be admirable, there's definitely a lot of rubble that you're going to end up seeing in some of these urban areas, hopefully, you know, less rather than more. I mean, Mariupol, some people have already begun to, to compare some of the scenes there to Grozny. And I certainly hope we don't see more of that. Um, unfortunately, the Russians are persistent. You know, they are dogged. And um, I think it, at some point, we're probably going to have to, to, to reckon with the fact that, um, that the Russians will have to be negotiated with. Keith, we'll give you the last word. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, unfortunately, I don't really see a, a, a good way out for Ukraine. I mean, it, in the negotiated settlement, which let's let's pray that happens, um, you know, they're going to have to give up something that they don't want to give up. It's, get, you know, the, the word Finlandization came up earlier, and uh, I, I, I can't see them getting out of a, uh, a, a negotiated settlement without an element of that, at least. The alternative would be yeah pretty devastated cities a lot of destruction which is much you know much worse but um equally though i don't i, I don't see a, a hugely good outcome for uh russia either i mean now that they've done this they kind of united the west against them uh you know sanctions are going to continue i can't i can't see how we're gonna ever get back to how what how things were before um and so they're going to be paying a price for this for years to come too so yeah it, it's not good for anybody this situation 
Well, I want to uh, thank all three of you guys for, for joining us. Too. This has been certainly one of our, our best shows uh, that we've done. And I, I, I think I might just go back and play it again because there were a lot of great great insights there. And I really appreciate your joining us, Keith Lowe, Sean McMeek, and David Murphy on a Sunday afternoon or evening. Thank you so much for being on Thanks History so Happy much, Hour guys. today. It's Thanks been so wonderful. Much. You've been an awesome yeah, panel. Thanks. And uh, check out their work. All of it is wonderful. Oh, yeah, we should go back and show those books show again the one books, more time. Read right? the articles. Stalin's War by Sean McMeekin. And we talked a little bit about the Finnish-Soviet Winter War, 1939-1940, by that Irish diplomat David Murphy. And uh, Prisoners of History uh, by Keith Lowe. All terrific books. And, uh, again, thank you so much. We really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, I have to remove, remove... And remove, okay. <laughs> I'm not used to removing three guests at once there. <laughs> uh, but that was, that's a, wow. There's some food for thought there, Chris. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, I should say to people, if you liked what you saw today, and uh, uh, you know, you could you please, uh, if you're on Facebook, uh, like us, or if you're on YouTube, subscribe to our channel. It takes only a second. We're so desperate for the appreciation. <laughs> uh, it would really help us. We want us. somebody to love us. Yeah, absolutely. And a big thank you to the growing list of folks supporting this effort via Patreon. Uh, here are our top shelf sponsors. But as we've always said, we do have room for more. If you don't see your name up there, it you know we'd be happy to put it up there. And it's you know it's uh, it's not that uh, that big an effort to do that. And Chris, what do we have? That's on patreoncom hour, by the way. But what do we have for next week? What is going on next week? Well, we have a little. Um kind of domestic turmoil and strife, uh, Burn, Bo Burn, Bomb, and Destroy by Michael Digby, a history of the German sabotage effort in North America in 1914-1917. So we'll talk a little bit about the Great War on the home front. So okay, most that. excellent. And I, 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 I want to say to our guests today, just hang on, we'll be, we're going to chat with you for a moment after the show. But to everybody else, thank you so, Thanks, so much for joining us. Be safe.